for the record, it's uh, Thursday, March 10th, 2016. It's 5.15 p.m. Time for the regular meeting of the Wenatchee City Council. For the record, we are out of executive session. First item would be the call of meeting to order and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Linda, would you lead us in the pledge? I'd be delighted. Great, thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and for roll call this evening, it's nice all seven council members are here today. First item on tonight's agenda are the consent items, which includes this evening's agenda, vouchers, and minutes from the previous meetings, and resolution 2016-12. Your Honor, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda consisting of this evening's meeting agenda, the vouchers and minutes from previous meetings, and resolution number 2016-12, fixing time for public hearing on a petition for annexation. Second. Motion by Councilmember Kula, second by Councilmember Bailey to adopt this evening's consent items as presented. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda tonight are citizen comments. To my understanding, we have a few folks that would like to address the city tonight. So we would ask that you come up, give us your name and address for the record, and we give you roughly three minutes. We're going to have a number of people, so we can all kind of take turns. I don't know who wants to go first. Come on up. Hello. My name is Heather Seaman, and I live at 1111 Okanagan Avenue. And I just wanted to come and express my pleasure with the lighting that you all have put in at the corner of Red Apple and Okanagan. I think it's really been safer, and the sidewalk as well. So I'm pleased oh, with good. that. It does create a situation where people just drive like a hack down Okanagan because they can see so well. Sure. And also another thing I've noticed that I'm pleased with is that um, when the ambulances come to Red Apple uh, Okanagan intersection, they're not turning on their sirens quite as long or because they can see as well. So I thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you. being here tonight. You, My pleasure. All right. Who's next? Come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Luz Alfaro, and I live at 211 Pace Drive, East Wenatchee. Um, I just want to say that it took less than 24 hours to get a boat out on the river to search for a person that drank with a car. But what has happened with my son's investigation? My son, Marco Sanchez Alfaro, has been missing since February 7. On February 12, Wenatchee Police Department put together a community search. There were around 80 citizens family members, and friends looking for my son. At this meeting, you, Mr. Kuntz, said that if we had any concerns about this case to contact you, I, as a mom, have the following questions. Why this search party took so long to take place? Why is Wanachi Police Department not looking harder to find my son? Don't get me wrong. I know that financially the city is in the best spot and that Wanachi Police Department it's in full its top, but you hear in the news that if a hiker is missing, helicopters are deployed as well as sniffing dogs. Even drones are sent out. Why haven't your police department sent out this help out to find my son? Sergeant West is doing all he can. He's only one person doing the job for maybe three, three detectives. Please hear my plea. My son is a great man. He is loved by all his family and friends and he is my only child. Please don't tell me that you will contact me with more information. You are, you are a parent too, and I bet you if one of your children goes missing, you will go crazy looking for him or her. Please, please help me. Help me to find my son. Thank you for being here, and I know. Tom, do you want to come up and get us up to speed on what's going on with the investigation and all that? I know you guys have been working sure. to yeah. try to locate Marcos and yeah. Okay. Just... I do have another set of questions. So. Oh, okay. Do you want to go ahead and go first? Yes. Okay. There's another set of questions I would like to ask. How many people are working on the case? How do they, how do they work? How many hours a day do they work on the case? Um, is there a missing person specialist for our county? How can we get more help to search in the river? 
Can we plan another search party with more media attention? Get the, maybe get the boats out in the river with us. I mean, we do have, as a family, we do have quite a bit of boats that we are planning to put into the river maybe this next weekend. Is there any possible way we can get um, maybe other counties' boats, borrow their boats with sonars so we can detect more of the river and spend a lot more time in the river instead of just, I believe the boat was in the river for about two or three hours the day of the big surge. Is there any possible way we can get... We'll, we'll check with boats. Tom and see what he says about what they have for boat searches and all that. So. And can we get her name for the record? Rosalie Rodriguez. <clears throat> and the address? 1517 Auckland Place, Rock Island, Thank you. I'm Chief Tom Robbins. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just kind of to address uh, some of the concerns and issues brought forth there on the investigation of the missing person from February 7th. Uh, the department, of course, uh, got a call on that, followed up on it, and uh, Sergeant West has led that investigation as the detective sergeant in charge of the detective division. And uh, we've had a number of people involved in that investigation. Early on, um, uh, the, we looked at a lot of cameras uh, from 10 Below where he was reported to be seen leaving there. So we had cameras all the way from 10 Below, uh, monitored cameras all the way down uh, South Wenatchee Avenue. Um, and actually, the last time he was seen on a camera was walking uh, from a camera was on in the uh, building uh, just to the south of the bridge. It's a repair building, auto repair, truck repair building. Mm -hmm. And there was a camera there that picked him up on the uh, overpass uh, bridge approach. So going east, walking east across that bridge. Uh, we've had the search party, of course, was involved. We've had searchers out there early on. Uh, and all indications are uh, that he went in the river. This is what we believe. Uh, Douglas County Sheriff's Office has a boat. So we have, we had their boat out the other day. There's a lot of searching going on. They have a sonar on the boat uh, that can actually look into the water uh, at some depth. I don't know how deep. And we don't have a boat, do we? We don't have a boat, no. And um, so we depend on them. And, and they used that same boat yesterday when they recovered uh, the body of Mr. Vincent, who uh, drove in the river uh, from Rock Island. That's a much different situation because he was in a vehicle. There was a witness that saw him drive in the river at that location and they knew where he was so the, they took the boat out with a sonar located the vehicle <clears throat> of course the body was in the vehicle so it's a much different situation than this is uh, this is a long protracted situation and uh, all the areas around the bridge were searched um, several times uh, the family had a huge search party out that did a lot of searching over several days and my understanding is they had boats out there also um, so they did a good job uh, searching on their end um, uh, but the bridge has got a, a hole, uh, if you go on, on the bridge and start walking across or driving across where the girders go up over the, the top of the bridge, when they did the construction and put the new sidewalk on, uh, the new sidewalk is to the south of the bridge, the roadbed. It, it's, it's mounted on the south part of the bridge and that was new. And there's a, a big high railing on both sides of that sidewalk that are probably about this height. Um, on the roadbed, there's a Jersey barrier about as high as this desk right here, the lower part of this desk, and uh, that's on the edge of the road. In most cases, when you have a Jersey barrier like that, you've got, um, when someone steps over it, there's concrete or something there, or, or asphalt, it sits a ways in. And in this case, uh, after that construction, um, there's water between that barrier and the high railing on the sidewalk, and there's about a three-foot distance between the two. And, uh, you know, if someone's walking across the bridge, for example, and, and there's no shoulder on, on the road, and they step over or they sit on the edge of the barrier, get tired and sit down, they could fall in the water. If they're getting out of the way of a car, they could step over and they'd go in the water. Mm -hmm. and, and we feel that he went in the water at some location, and that would be very likely a location where he could have gone in. The cell phone uh, was turned off around midnight. Um, and there's been no calls. His friends were trying to call him and they couldn't, couldn't call him. So no activity on his cell phone since about midnight, the night that he disappeared. I think he was seen, uh, I think uh, Sergeant West said he was seen about 1245 walking across that overpass toward the bridge. 
Uh, he had a debit card in his wallet. We check all those kind of things. There's no activity on that. Uh, we do a lot of uh, like intelligence that we can do on, on the individual to see if they had any issues with other people that might be a threat, that sort of thing. There's no indication of that. So it's a situation where we've done about all we can do right now. Uh, it's not something where a boat in the river probably is going to do anything uh, right at this time. Um, we have contacted Douglas County again to have them get the boat out. Of course, they were tied up with it yesterday. And uh, we don't know for sure if they went out after they located the body yesterday and did some searching with it. Um, but we have asked him to come out of the boat again and do some more searching. Most likely, if he is in the river, um, uh, I know this is hard to listen to and hard to hear, and my condolences go to the family on this because we'd love to find him. Um, and we'd love to find him alive, but I, I, you know, right now we're just not real... So, so is there a chance that we can get some more boat people? Uh, another Douglas County's boat would go out for a day or two and... I mean, and do some we'll contact them and see if they will. We have contacted them and asked them if we could get the boat out. The so has a boat. They have to have staff to operate the boat that are trained. Right. And so there are certain staff that can run the boat. So we will do that again. Okay. Uh, we did we did call today and we didn't hear back. So I'm sure that they'll be calling us to find out what they can do for us. And okay. it'll depend on their staffing level, what they have there. Um, and so I think we're doing all we can do right now. Uh, and we're monitoring the river. Uh, there's there's boats in the river, you know, fishermen and that sort of thing, and people out in, in the river. So normally, uh, unfortunately, in a situation like this, if he is in the river, uh, at some point uh, we'll get a, we'll get a call. But but that's not what. Ruth, you have a question? Yeah, want I do, mm -hmm. um, Chief. I know that over the years you hear about people drowning in the river. Um, do you know of any situations where somebody may have drowned? We know for sure they're in the river. I know in this case we're speculating he's in the river, but right. mm -hmm. um, in other cases we know they're in the river. Do you know of any case where it went this long without finding a body? It's, or it's, is it normal or is it not normal? Or It's actually normal. It's, a, it's not unusual, let me put it that way. Uh, especially this cold weather during the cold weather period. Um, but we had, for example, the young girl that um, jumped off of the uh, dock at the uh, Rolling Paddle Club about mm -hmm. I don't know, three years ago. Um, we, we did the same kind of a search. We knew she went in the water because she jumped in the water and, and a young man rescued her friend out of the water and wasn't able to get her before she went down the river. And the, the current's pretty strong. People don't realize how strong that current is. But um, with her, we had boats in the water because where she went in, we had family boats. The family had boats out. We had boats out. Actually, one of our officers had a private boat that was out um, and worked for several days looking for her. And what's normal, and I think most of us that have lived around the river here very long know this, but what's normal is if a body goes in the river it, it, uh, through Wenatchee area here, if it goes in the river, it'll go with the current. And it depends on, of course, the heat. You know, if, you, if it's cold weather, it's, it's going to take longer for it to surface. Um, so it's taken this long or longer for oh, others. Oh, definitely. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty normal. And, for, and, and again, I know this is difficult for the family to hear, so I, I'm kind of reluctant to talk too much about it. But, but the thing is, uh, in reality, uh, if a body goes in that river, it's going to take probably 30 to 60 days for it to surface. And whether we're warming up into the spring, um, you know, I, I would not be at all surprised if we got a call, but it's probably going to be in April sometime, you know, and I, it's just a possibility. But I'm, and then, of course, you get down the river a ways and, and uh, you don't know for sure how far it, the, the body went, that, that kind of thing. And it is speculation, but but uh, we've, we've you know, talked about this and, and worked on it and that sort of thing. And there really isn't anything else we can do other than put a boat in the river to look, you know, for that. We have no indication at all. There was any foul play. We have no indication that uh, he had any contacts that were dangerous. Uh, uh, the information we have is he was a, a good kid. And uh, so it's, it's just one of those things. Uh, what? Yeah, we need to uh, push this button. Yeah. Anybody know? Excuse me a minute, I'll see what that goes on the phone in this conversation. There. I got it. What do you have? Oh, she's got it. Or Captain's got it. 
Back on? It was on pause for a while. Okay. Thank you. Are we all right? Thanks, Tim, yeah. for doing that. All right. Anybody else wish to address the council at this time? I know we had a few other folks that were interested in addressing the council, so please come up, give us your name and address for the record. Jane Gonzalez, 1711 9th Street. And I'm also here about Marcos. We worked with him for a year, you know, a couple of years at Lowe's. Um, I kind of wonder, because I've heard of this before, is there any way that you can turn the turbines off and send divers in if he's close to check to make sure he's all, not? All I know is it's very dangerous to be in, in the water. Uh, I've talked to a couple of divers today that says it's very murky and very dangerous. We could talk with the PUD about turning off the turbines. That would be their call, not ours. We can certainly reach out to them about that. What do you need to do to do you need petitions what do you need or just uh, don't know I, I would you just have to contact them and then see if that's something they would do i've never heard of the pud turbin turning off the turbines for this actually kind of it was somebody from the pud who suggested it yeah well maybe that's so. a that's a good idea I, we can certainly contact them i'll have our staff contact the pud tomorrow and see what the process for that would be all right did you catch that chief thank you yeah Do you have any more questions for me? No, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. No, well, we'll You've got on. the ambulance coming for okay. her to check her. So. Chief, Chief, just one quick question. You mentioned Douglas County, you know, their boat in this county. Doesn't Chelan County have a boat? Are they involved with this? Uh, they do have boats, but they, they haven't been involved with this one. Douglas County's been involved because they have sonar on their boat, and uh, Chelan County doesn't have that. So the sonar helps as far as when they go out to try to see if they can, if they can see uh, anything. So. I think with that yesterday they were successful using the sonar on that locating that car you know so um okay but, that's good yeah. so okay. thank you thanks all right anybody else wish to address the council i know there's probably a few other folks
Uh, my name is Mark Seaman, 1111 Okanagan Avenue. And Brian Campbell, 1837 Jefferson Street. And I would like to extend my sorrow to Marco's family, and uh, I'm sorry they're going through what they are. Uh, I am a, a homeowner and business owner in South Wenatchee, and I wanted to thank the uh, Wenatchee Council and staff for the improvements they've been making South Chelan Avenue and Okanagan Avenue. I think these in incremental improvements um, are wonderful. You know, over a period of time, um, these are really going to help, I think, most all of the, the residents of South Wenatchee. Um, and I, I also forgot to mention I'm on the board of the UNA organization, a recent uh, board member. And so I look forward to working with uh, city council and staff on future projects as we move forward with some of our initiatives. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, with Mark coming on the United Neighborhood Association board, that's a, a real valuable asset also, uh, his wife Heather. Um, he's got a real good plan, kind of a five-year plan on some of the improvements that need to, to get done, and, and we're going to be putting together a, a team to um, think about the process and how we're going to go through this. So it'll, we understand it's going to be a long process. We do appreciate what the city's done in the in the south end and, and to continue to focus on that. And, we know money's an issue, but um, we're going to be working together to really help integrate um, with the rest of the community and not just be kind of a one-time, you know, put some money in the South End and, and then not pay attention to it. So really excited about that and really uh, glad that Mark and Heather are involved. And Manuel also wanted to um, mention that United Neighborhood Association, some of the group would be willing to help out in any way to um, help locate Carlos and what, anything that we can do. And also little concern as far as the um, the bridge with uh, the improvements that were made to have that hole uh, <laughs> there that might be something we need to to talk with the highway department about on why they left that there because I could certainly see somebody jump over that Jersey barrier and go right down to the river not expecting that to happen so if we could have somebody look into that that'd be great <coughs> thank, you. thank you thank you Anybody else wish to address the council at this time? Seeing no takers, we will move on to our presentations. We have two this evening. One is to uh, recognize our Apple Blossom Royalty, Queen Corey Martin and Princess Emily Holmes and Sammy Everhart. And I know we have a proclamation to read, Councilmember Harold. Yes. Whereas the Washington State Apple Blossom Festival has been a Wenatchee community tradition since 1920 and Whereas Washington State Apple Blossom Festival is a premier family-oriented festival that showcases, showcases our people, community, heritage, and fruit industry. And whereas the Washington State Apple Blossom Festival Royalty help promote this ongoing community celebration and act as ambassadors of our community at local, state, and international celebrations. And whereas Corey Martin has been selected as the 2016 Festival Queen, with Emily Holmes and Sammy Everhart selected as the 2016 Festival Princesses. Now, therefore, I, Frank J. Kuntz, on behalf of the City of Wenatchee Council, do hereby formally congratulate and bestow our appreciation to the 2016 Washington State Apple Blossom Festival Queen, Corey Martin, and Princesses Emily Holmes and Sammy Everhart, in witness whereof I hereby set my hand and cause the seal of the City of Wenatchee to be affixed on this 10th day of March, 2016, Frank J. Kuntz, Mayor. Thank you, Linda. Come on up, ladies. Come on up. How are you? Nice to see you again. How are you? Nice to see you. I got, oh, look at that. How are you? Missed you the other night at the chamber banquet. You were at DECA. How did that go? It was great. Good. So I'll give that to you, one to you, and one to you and you. Thank you. You want the microphone for a minute? Are you used to this yet? Sure, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for having us, and thank you for these. We really appreciate it, and we really appreciate the opportunity to serve this community. We hope that we can represent it as well as it deserves to be represented. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. introduce your chaperones. Yes. Yes, chaperones. Should we introduce your chaperones? You want me to do it or you want to do it? Yeah, either way. Chaperones Kate Bradford and Kristen Holmberg are both with them. Thank you, ladies.
And we have one more presentation tonight regarding Red Cross Month. So Councilmember Huffaker has that. Yeah. So this is uh, the 2016th American Cross Red Cross Month. <coughs> and the proclamation is as follows. Whereas the American Red Cross has touched many lives in, the Wenat in Wenatchee, as well as across the country and around the world, whereas the American Red Cross is synonymous with helping people and has been doing so for more than 130 years, whereas throughout the past year, the American Cross has launched hundreds of disaster relief operations in the United States to help people affected by fires, floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes, Whereas our local Greater Inland Northwest Chapter of the Red Cross works tirelessly through its strong network of local volunteers to support us when disasters strike, when someone needs life-saving blood or the comfort of a helping hand, when disasters like the 2015 Sleepy Hollow Fire, the Mastiff Chelan and Okanagan Complex fires, or flooding and severe weather emergency strike, our local Red Cross volunteers are there to support our public safety responders and provide emergency shelters for our community. Whereas the Greater Inland Northwest Chapter local disaster teams respond to assist the families displaced by house or apartment fires, it also provides 24-hour support to members of the military, veterans, and their families and provide training in first aid, CPR, aquatics training for our community. Whereas for nearly 100 years, the United States president has called on the American people to support the Red Cross and its humanitarian mission. Whereas our community depends on the Red Cross and because it is not a government agency, the Red Cross depends on the support from public to continue its humanitarian work. I, Frank Coons, mayor of the city of Wenatchee, do hereby proclaim March 2016 as American Red Cross Month. I encourage the people of the city of Wenatchee and our community to hereby to take steps to be ready for emergencies through preparedness activities. Also to support the humanitarian mission of the Greater Inland Northwest Chapter of the Red Cross by volunteering, getting trained, or donating. In witness whereof, I hereby set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Wenatchee to be affixed on this 10th day of March 2016th, Frank J. Coons Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Huffaker. Do we have a representative of the Red Cross here this evening? A couple of them? Come on up. Sure, we'll represent it tonight by myself on the, on the board, Sildrick Isaacson, and the Andy Angelo. She's a uh, local Red Cross volunteer, and she serves the, uh, lots of things in the community, but she serves the uh, Service of Armed Forces branch of the Red Cross. So, um, uh, Rick and I uh, have been on the board for what, probably six or seven years now, and there have been some transitions, but it's always amazing the amount of volunteers that Wenatchee Valley has for the Red Cross, and it really came into play last summer, as we all know, with the um, with the, the fire uh, in our town, in addition to moving up to Shillan and Okanagan County, and the number of volunteers that came not only from our community, which is a large amount, but also nationwide, which our local volunteers and local full-time staff at the Red Cross uh, uh, managed that response and the fire response. So certainly can't could do without the volunteers, and we appreciate appreciate that, and we appreciate your support. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Staff, uh, March 24th, 6 p.m. Performing Arts Center is our Heroes Awards. Oh. A lot of fun. Free pastries, coffee, juices, and so forth. It'll last about an hour and a half, and you'll meet some amazing people. So I think I told you if we get out of council, I will come down. Yes. Yes. Yeah, maybe a longer meeting, I think, the 24th. Oh. I can see you down right after the meeting okay. for that. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Thanks, Thank Rick. You. Appreciate it. All right, action items. Here's a good one. Put a smile on my face. This is a good one. And um, Ethan, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. You bet. Thanks for being here. I'm going to have you. So, um, Ethan Toth, I'm introducing to you. And as we have uh, gone to the Association of Washington Cities Conference the last couple of years, and as we have watched the students that they've honored with 
um, the award scholarship. It's a competitive process. It's clear that those students have had a role with their city governments. And so this year, uh, I think we have a very wonderful candidate in Ethan Toth. Um, Ethan approached the city along with Sam Monson, and uh, we got acquainted with the makers movement. Everybody said, what is a maker? And uh, Ethan has uh, educated all of us uh, with his energy and leadership and enthusiasm. And um, we just really quickly, uh, Steve and Karen, Karen was going to be here tonight. Uh, Karen presented this presentation at the White House at their Makers Roundtable. Ethan could describe that experience, but we thought it might be fun just to run through it really quickly. Steve, so I was going to have Steve run through what was presented at the White House with folks from the Makers Movement across the country. So. Well, there's no way I could replicate what Karen did. <laughs> Karen was an awesome advocate for Wenatchee. And what she, they, what they call them, a shotgun blast or something speech. She had like three or minutes or something. Of course, she took five, and they were waving the flags at her. But it was, it was awesome. Um, so Karen, <clears throat> Tammy, it's not. Uh, it's showing. It, it's, it's not. Uh, the slides are not clicking. Oh, there we go. There okay. We go. Okay. So Karen uh, made sure to introduce Wenatchee properly to let everybody know where Wenatchee was. And she made sure that folks knew that Wenatchee was a small community because we were in rooms with uh, Pittsburgh and Houston and yeah. Seattle and Portland and San Francisco, all the, the big dogs. I think there was maybe only one other community that was still bigger than us, maybe 100,000 people. And so um, she first introduced our community, made sure they knew, knew where we were from and our, our size and um, culture. And then she basically started to explain how the rest of the world knows Wenatchee. They know Wenatchee because when they flip on their lights, they get our hydropower. They know Wenatchee from their aluminum plants. They know Wenatchee from the apples, of course, and the data farms. And talked about the exoskeleton and how we're innovators and we have this history of uh, this culture of um, of create, creating and making things, uh, uh, taming the wild, so to speak, with dams and railroads and whatnot. So Karen just did this marvelous job of, of setting all kinds of energy in the presentation. Talked a little bit about our youth, and hence, um, I don't think there's anybody, I think you guys were the only young folks in the room, weren't you? Yeah. It was, it was awesome introducing um, uh, Ethan and Story and um, talked a little bit about the maker movement in Wenatchee and how it started, like Allison said, and, and then um, really set the stage for, uh, we did a kind of a round table after these shotgun speeches. And we were only, what, there was probably five shotgun speeches or thereabouts? Yeah. Yeah, so out of maybe 50 cities over there, where there was only five. And, and, uh, and then, um, Ethan, you want to tell a little bit about what you said or at the uh, round table? Yeah, if I can remember it correctly. I kind of um, remember so yeah, no, yeah. So it was an incredible opportunity to be able to go to the White House and present Wenatchee and be able to represent Wenatchee on a national scale. Um, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I think it was something along the lines of how I appreciated Wenatchee getting a say in what this movement was doing across our nation. Um, Wenatchee doesn't scream innovation, but what we're doing is exactly that. And I think that's what we got across at the meeting and so it was incredible going to this round table and talking about the localized making that we have we have our apples we have our hospital we have um, students working in the classroom with uh, 3d printers with um, solar cars and all these incredible projects that lead to bigger projects and so just getting the chance to be able to talk about what Wenatchee was doing and then where we're looking to go in the next couple of years was incredible and I think that's what really what the main purpose of the meeting was and so it was just you know cool to go to the white house and talk about that um and yeah <laughs> and, and and the i i remember specifically you guys talked about the ability to be involved in something to make a bigger difference a difference in the world yeah. not only in wenatchee but in the world and um i'll tell you what folks were just thrilled and that these high school uh, kids were taken young men were taken on make a mini maker fair which has not ever been done by youth they're the first in the nation to do that um and so it was really impressive to hear uh, big dogs that have been in this for a long time 
talking about how impressed they were with Wenatchee and what we were doing. And our, one of our advantages is, well, you take away certain things. Our advantages is we don't have the bureaucracies of the San Francisco's and the Pittsburgh's to wade through. They struggle to do things, and we're out there just doing them. So that's a cool, pretty cool thing to... Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I wanted to add is I don't think I've ever thanked you guys enough for the support you've offered me because I've gone to, I've talked to producers of Maker Fairs in San Francisco and in New York where bureaucracy holds them back and you guys have just pushed me forward. So I think I want to thank you all for that because that was incredibly helpful in pursuing this process. Ethan, we should thank you. You're very inspirational, very impressive. Thank you. So we've got Ethan up for a $500 scholarship to the 1000 Yes. So you're asking us to do a motion to... Yes, so we are looking for a motion uh, to have the mayor sign a letter of support that will be submitted to the Association of Washington Cities. And uh, Ethan's name would then be forwarded to the committee to compete. Uh, obviously, AWC puts this out statewide, and they award six scholarships. And if you are uh, selected um, at the conference in June, then they make those awards. Well, Your Honor, I make a motion to recommend Ethan Toth for the 2016 AWC Center for Quality Community S Scholarship. Second. second. Motion by Councilmember Bailey, second by Councilmember Huffaker to recommend Ethan Toth for the 2016 AWC Community Scholarship. Any questions or comments? Ethan, you're an amazing young man, and I think we're going to be hearing a lot more from you over the years. For, and thank you for. Don't what forget you're doing. who we are when you become famous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you thank came you. from. <laughs> no doubt we're supporting the right man. <laughs> thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Ethan, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Ethan, I'll, uh, I'll be there in, uh, in Everett uh, in June, and I expect to be there to watch you get a scholarship. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next item is regarding an agreement with Shalane County Fire District 1. So you have before you a first amendment to the pre-annexation interlocal agreement between the City of Wenatchee and Shalane County Fire Protection District number 1. And uh, as the b brief uh, background states, as we work through the process and as the assessor set uh, the rates for this year, um, we went through a process with the fire district and uh, this interlocal agreement. Um, after they set the values, there was a realization that there was a difference. And so in order to make this transition smoother, this uh, interlocal agreement provides for a, a five-year time to help equalize and get through the transition period. So this is the, basically the property, t the, the tax levy, the dollar fifty that they had budgeted that became a dollar forty seven that became a dollar forty one. So this is our way of making Chelan County Fire District whole based on what they had budgeted. And I think we talked about it last year when we set the budget. This is in our budget for this amount. And uh, until until there's a levy left of some variety, their EMS levy or some other kind, they're going to be short. So we've got this little contract to kind of plug that gap for them for the next five years. It'll be less if there's a, some sort of a levy issue, but if not, um, this is trying to make them whole. And the way the assessed values came in, they were not whole. So this money basically ended up in our budget instead of their budget. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, I'll make a motion to authorize the mayor's signature on the First Amendment to the pre-annex interlocal agreement between the city of Wenatchee and Chelan County Fire Protection District number one. Second. Motion by Councilmember Huffaker, second by Councilmember Esparza to authorize the mayor's signature on the First Amendment with Chelan County Fire District one. <coughs> Questions or comments? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Allison, Diversity Council. And the Diversity Council is back. They are going to get up to their 16 members. <laughs> we, Good. we have another uh, uh, application that will be coming forward. But at their uh, latest meeting, Elisa Martinez uh, from the YWCA submitted her application. Um, they were thrilled to have her come on board. Uh, she will be back uh, here in April with the resolution for um, the uh, Stand Against Racism that they're going to be doing with the college in April. Uh, and so they were thrilled to have her as a part of the Diversity Council. So her application is included, and a motion to approve Resolution 2016-14 would appoint her to a new three-year term. 
Mayor, I make a motion for resolution number 2016-14, appointing a member of the, the Diversity Advisory Committee for a three-year term, Lisa Martinez. Second. Motion by Councilmember Poyer, second by Councilmember Harold to adopt resolution 2016-14, appointing Alyssa Martinez to the Diversity Advisory Committee. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Allison. You're welcome. So next up is the public participation plan for the comprehensive plan. Glenn, how are you today? Good, yourself? I'm good, thank you. <coughs> Thanks for having this on the agenda. This uh, uh, follows up our workshop on the uh, comprehensive plan update process for 2016 to 2017. And we have, uh, well, it's a state requirement for us to look at our comprehensive plan and development regulations every eight years. Um, it's a little longer with some of the things the leg legislature was doing. Our last time was 2006, and uh, this is an opportunity for us, though, to uh, see how we've been doing and make some strategic uh, course uh, corrections. And we'd be looking at having a draft uh, with some uh, recommendations going out in January. Um, and then a process of, uh, um, after going through those workshops to build it with the Planning Commission, a process of uh, open house and uh, workshops, uh, both with yourselves and the uh, Planning Commission and hearings in April, May, and potentially in June of 2017. Uh, so this, uh, um, formally uh, doing this in a resolution helps us in, uh, in one step uh, meet a state requirement to um, have this on the record for our process. And we have a um, our, our website, uh, which we would go live with in a, a couple weeks, and we'll be posting and keeping that up to date, um, and uh, a number of other items as well. And I uh, would uh, request you consider uh, adoption of this uh, resolution to begin our process. Sure. Any questions for Glenn? Uh, are you going to have public meetings along with this? Correct. So we'd have um, a series of workshops every month starting in April okay. uh, with the Planning Commission that will be open to the public. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, posting everything on the web. We're uh, going to do also do a newspaper um, legal ad and encourage the uh, Wenatchee World to uh, uh, maybe do an article. Uh, encourage folks to come to the meetings and then uh, looking at an open house um, in uh, early next year. Uh, try to have an interactive process where folks can come in and um, look at the trends, look at some of the changes, see what they think, give us some feedback. We'll have a formal 60-day uh, review and comment period. I've been able to track down an uh, original list of stakeholder groups uh, that we had for the 2006 process. So I'd like to uh, reach out to them to hopefully they'll take a look and uh, comment as well and be encouraging the public to participate and give us some feedback. Okay, good. Any other questions? If not, I would entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I uh, make a motion. We adopt resolution number 2016-13, establishing a public participation plan and schedule related to the City of Wenatchee Urban Area Comprehensive Plan Update uh, by the community and economic development staff. Second. Motion by Councilmember Markart, second by Councilmember Bailey to adopt resolution 2016-13 regarding the public participation plan for the update of the comp plan. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks for the email this week. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Sewer comprehensive plan. Mr. Leonard, sir. Hi, Manuel. Mayor and Council. Matt Leonard, Public Works Operations Manager. So we've been working on updating the sewer comp plan um, the current sewer comp plan, um, the CIP, the capital improvement plan for that, ended in 2015. And there's a bunch of projects that have been addressed through our wastewater treatment plan update process, as well as um, looking at different options for funding sewer extensions. Um, so this this is just, we uh, staff selected Gray and Osborne to do this um, project. The budget's $150,000, and we're hoping to have this completed um, by the end of this uh, this year, um, 
so we can start on you know potentially moving forward with sewer <coughs> extensions um, potentially in the sunny slope area um, so this you know this is just for an engineer to update the comprehensive plan and we'll do a probably end up doing a submittal to ecology for their review um, if, if, if it's required and the results of the comprehensive plan this isn't necessarily an analysis of the plant and capacity yeah so that's all been done so this will just be um, looking at some of our extension it's mostly looking at rates uh, okay. we'll do it look at a do a rate analysis and to look at funding options for funding sewer extensions um, and then we'll also be looking at some of these different routes and, and areas ways to serve the sunny slope area we um, look at for, age of lines and that kind of stuff for um that's in the current comp plan i don't we didn't really want to get to that level um that's that's pretty much identified in that cip i mean they might be looked at at some uh, just a gen what was in the existing one was just kind of general sewer extension projects just budgeted every year so we 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 may if we we'll go through and and figure out if we have any issue er, areas we're having issues and address those but i don't foresee uh, too much of that so this is primarily extension or yeah it's extending out to areas that don't yeah we want to get as much into it as we can so this doc document lasts a while um, um but we don't want to get we only have a 150 grand we don't want to get the scope too broad so it delays this too far so the idea would be comprehensive plan first then some design work in sunny slope area and then perhaps a building of a sewer extension not to yeah. easy street and school so street. it's gonna yeah it'll look at different options for getting out so different there's a, some right of way and easement stuff for the sunny slope area that we have to work through so we'll that'll kind of address and get some so we'll have to do some planning um, to get a good estimate for those costs so that there'll be some little bit of design preliminary design work as part of this okay. Matt you mentioned you know rate studies they not my memory serves me right here what within the last what couple of years we did a major rate study did we not or was that on water I think that was yeah. water was that water okay yeah, this hasn't been done since 2006 okay okay so there's no statutory requirement for the sewer comp plan for updating it every so many years it's mm -hmm. only if you make changes if you add if you if your uga grows mm -hmm. and you need to serve new areas or if uh, you're doing major changes if you're adding new lift station areas or things mm -hmm. so there's or if your plant has big changes but so that's kind of when you go and do it so we just did that treatment plan update so we went and that identified a bunch of projects that are going to need to look at rates for that so it's really good timing to so we can incorporate that and look at these other options at the same time and it'll save us some money from having two separate contracts mm -hmm. okay good thank you all right any other questions for matt if not i would entertain a motion your honor i move for to authorize the mayor to negotiate with gray and osborne incorporated for engineering services for the sewer comprehensive plan updates project number 1608 nothing, nothing. Second. Motion by Councilmember Harold, second by Councilmember Poyer to authorize the mayor to negotiate with Gray and Osborne to update the sewer comprehensive plan. Questions and comments? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Uh, got an LID foreclosure. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Steve Smith, City Attorney. I'm here seeking a, uh, approval of Ordinance 2016-05. This would authorize the commencement of a foreclosure process of uh, delinquent LID assessments on two parcels of property uh, that relate to the Riverside Drive Local Improvement District. If you remember back in 2007, 2008, we developed the new Riverside Drive down along the river. And as part of that, um, an assessment, uh, local improvement district was um, established to pay for some of those improvements and the local property owners were assessed a certain amount of, of the cost based on their uh, front footage. And 
Uh, we have one property owner that owns two parcels that is delinquent two years, and the statute says that if they're delinquent two years, then we need to start the foreclosure process. And um, two things are going on here. One, the, the statute says that you're required to start it by March 1st or an alternate date as established by council. Um, we didn't make the March 1st date um, due to some notice and communications with the owner. So we want to establish a, an alternative date of getting it started not later than June 1st. And then also our city code requires an ordinance um, be approved that directs the city attorney to start the, the foreclosure process. So, so this ordinance provides for both of those things. And I, under, I understand um, DM McDaniel presented on this today at the Finance Committee, but if yeah. anybody else has questions, I'm happy to you know, ask them, answer them. Yeah, we discussed it at finance at <coughs> length today. Any questions for Steve? If not, I would entertain a motion. Your Honor, I make a motion for ordinance number 2016-05, authorizing commencement of foreclosure of the delinquent local improvement assessment 200801-004 and 200801-005 of BBP1 LLC, a property owner within the Riverside Drive Local Improvement District number 2008-01 on or before June 1, 2016. Second. A motion by Council Member Esparza and a second by Council Member Markhart to adopt Ordinance 2016-05 <clears throat> regarding the foreclosure procedures for BBP1 LLC. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. The last item on our uh, agenda tonight is a supplement with SCJ Alliance regarding administrative <coughs> services for the Mission Street Miller Project. City Engineer Gary Owen. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. I'm Gary Owen, City Engineer. Um, I've been back and forth on this project uh, for a number of things, most recently to have you guys award it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, what I got here, uh, this is bigger than we administratively do out in public works, so uh, we need the mayor's approval for a supplement to our current agreement with Shekar Jewel uh, to perform the necessary construction, engineering, inspection, materials, documentation, that sort of thing. Um, on the uh, on our Mission Miller Chelan Miller intersections project that we just awarded uh, a couple of weeks ago, so it should be the last time that I got to come back to you and ask for anything on this project until hopefully it's done and and uh, we're doing final acceptance on it later this year. So uh, did SCJ Alliance design this? They did. And are, is there a reason why we're not using city people to inspect the work of the oh. contractor? Yeah, we get in this issue of we have the architect who designs it and goes out and inspects their contractor's work. And we had that issue kind of in downtown Wenatchee a little bit. Yeah, they, um, well, it, it's not uncommon to have an engineer, uh, does, or these, right. our, our local firms especially, out of town firms as well, uh, inspect a lot of the work uh, that they've, they've designed. There's a lot of different uh, technical aspects that uh, staff doesn't have. Uh, the ability and uh, we've also got a number of other projects going on keeping what what uh, you know little uh, field staff that we have busy this summer so this one was uh, was budgeted and, and planned um, I did you know there has there was some question about uh, inspection uh, with this firm um, and I worked with them on on who they were going to bring on board for the actual on the ground uh, field uh, work that's going to be mostly mostly done at nighttime, and they're going to bring somebody on staff that uh, has been uh, good and um, acceptable to city staff in the past on a couple of past projects. So I'm confident they'll uh, they'll take care of what needs to be taken care of to get this thing built. You know, a set of construction plans is is is, is it's not perfect. You know, so there's there's a number of things that you know there there's uh, there's things, there's nuances where you got to work with a contractor to try to get the intent figured out of the contract, just like a, you know, a written contract, something that you're building is, is very similar. So, Mr. Corrigan, is he the one that's going to do the inspection work? Yes. Okay, thank you. The primary on-the-ground inspection work. 
and then I want to keep their traffic engineer on board for the the uh, those those signals are pretty critical out there. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Gary? Your Honor, for um, disclosure, I uh, through my uh, work I administer a contract with SCJ Alliance on behalf of my employer. It is not even remotely related to this issue, and it's a relationship where I authorize payments uh, to them as opposed to the other direction uh, upon satisfactory completion of the work. And I don't believe that it materially affects my judgment and ability to participate in voting on this matter. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. All right. I would entertain a motion if we had one. Well, Your Honor, I move that uh, the City Council to authorize the Mayor to approve Supplement Number 2 with SCJ Alliance providing for construction administration services for the Mission Street, Miller Street intersection, Chelan Avenue, Miller Street, and Springwater Street intersection project number 1303. Second. Motion by Councilmember Bailey, second by Councilmember Harold to authorize the mayor's signature on supplement number two with SCJ Alliance. Questions or comments? Hearing none. I, I actually have a comment. Um, when I was reading through this stuff, you know, I, I have issues with us approving something to go through, and then once it's approved, then it comes back with supplements or stuff involving money. Um, I know it sometimes, you know, it has to happen, but if we could avoid that in the future, that I'd, I'd feel more comfortable. I don't know. So... Gary, how would you recommend we do it differently if Council Member Esparza, we, we do one full contract with all of it in it and then authorize the mayor to make these kinds of calls? Well, we could we could talk with uh, the finance director about it. And because we, you know, we, we've, we've got a process now where we authorize um, and we go through and get a, a, a budget authorization for a project. And we don't really need to, you know, we don't come back unless we blow it by 5% or more and we need to come back for more money. Something happens and things change. Um, uh, for, for smaller things, if they're less than, and I don't, I don't know, is Deanne back there? She's back there. I think, She's I think, I think we can approve administratively contracts and amendments, that sort of thing, up to thirty-five dollars or $50,000 in the department. Beyond that, we don't have we don't have authorization. I mean, we could probably up that, but you know, sometimes we've got you know we some of our contracts and that are pretty big, and the supplements are pretty sizable. So there's always going to be times when you know we'll we'll exceed our administrative authority to just take care of this yeah. at the department level. Maybe it's so. just me being naive as to how these things actually work in practice, but it just I we, don't know. We typically supplement these design agreements, engineering agreements uh, later. We don't, we don't give them all the work up front. We wait and see how things go, how the design comes along. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, as the mayor mentioned, we may inspect them with our own staff if we have staff available and, and the, depending on the complexity of the project. If that's the case, then we wouldn't supplement, them, uh, supplement their contract and, and ask them to do additional work that's already budgeted. Okay. So, so in addressing your issue, um, and this is something where I would like input from the entire council. Do you, we currently have a policy if it's over, I can't remember whether it's 30, 50, or 60 right now off the top of my head, but if it's already budgeted and it's under that dollar amount, your director has the authority to go through and sign off on that. If it isn't, uh, or if it's over that amount, it needs to come back before council or have the mayor sign it or something like that. That is in our policies. So we can go through and change that if the council wants that to happen, and we could have that come before the finance committee. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Ruth, but you know we want those things to come back so we know what's going on. I think it's more of a, how come a project that started here just it feels like these projects just keep going and going and going and That's getting so issue. big. Yeah. We, yeah. we started out with just such a small little amount here, and all of a sudden we've doubled, tripled. And, and, and I've expressed this frustration in the past as well. I'd, I would like us to uh, make a better effort of figuring out what it's going to be cost-wise and, and being too much and come back and saying, we saved you money. And I'd, <laughs> no. I'd, rather, I'd rather approve that one and give the attaboys than 
<laughs> Believe it or not, it happens once in a while, but that's that's not the norm. Perhaps the was. discussion is when we when we when we first start discussing the projects. Um, I, I'm kind of familiar with this um, <laughs> that we talk about the you know the, the total scope, and then that first step is this component of it, so that we're all understanding that there's more bills that are coming because it's a 1.5 million dollar project and not the initial. $250,000 of design portions of it. Yeah, I'm confused on the word supplement means to me we didn't know versus a project that goes, these are the steps, here's the overall project. project. Yeah, so I'm, and that's, I'm, I, I'm, the wording's confusing to me and also the 5% versus 30 to 50,000, I don't which I don't know which one, which one is it? Is it 5% I, I, or is it 30 to 50? It's in our financial policies. I think I think it's fifty. So okay. the project, if the project is a hundred thousand dollars, and you need to go through and spend a hundred and five, or a hundred and seven, when it gets to a hundred and seven, you need to come back. A hundred and five, you have the authority to go through and do that. The thirty fifty is going through and saying you have this project. It's a hundred thousand, and a component of it is twenty thousand. Gary gets to go through and sign that agreement. Otherwise, if it's over that it has to come back before council. I do agree with Keith on, we, we, I don't want to close my eyes. Yeah. I do want to I, I, I guess part of the problem to me is, is that we get so far down the road and you know now the project's this far down the road, we have to finish it and it yeah. feels like we're stuck. We don't have a choice anymore because mm -hmm. we've already spent this much, we got to go a little bit more and we got to go a little more and we got to go a little more. And that's so. where we were when we were awarding this particular project yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I understand. If the other side of that equation though would be, okay, we're gonna do this project and they think it's 500, so they put in 800 and you guys go, we're not spending 800. And so, so you, you, there's a little bit of the other side too. I mean, we, we got to try to hit the engineer's estimates pretty close with a little bit of overage, but we don't want to overshoot it so far that- I, I, I don't yeah. disagree with that either. But. Yeah. 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 We're just at this level of time where it's frustrating because every project comes in over and it's been that way for a couple of years. Couple of years yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think we've done a real good job in the department of, of, of keeping uh, an overview, you know, project list, you know, status report that, you know, isn't too much information, but isn't too little information that you guys, you know, have access to and, and can look at these things and then call staff and ask questions. If you have questions, what's going on with this project um, sort of thing. And, and that's one thing, you know, we've been talking about, you know, it takes time to do that. It takes staff to do some of that, but it's really important. It's, it's one of those things that needs to be done. You guys need to know, you know, yeah. not necessarily all the minutiae, but to some of the point, you know, to, some, to some point, what all the activities are especially when, you know, we were this week, we have 20 some active projects right now that engineering is working on. So that's quite a list and then details on top of that can, it, I think the last time Dan Frazier tried it, he wound up with such a multi-page document, he threw his hands up in the air and said, I gotta, I gotta try to figure something else out here. So- All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, mayor's report, I'm not even sure what to, uh, talk about. I, I will mention uh, just in terms of kind of gathering stuff, the uh, fireworks bill that Representative uh, Hawkins has presented is, did not make it out of uh, Olympia this year, so that is gone. Um, I believe our DDA bill is still alive. Allison, I haven't heard that it's not still alive. Right, and so I think based on news today, there are several bills being rolled up into the fire omnibus bill, so we're hopeful it's still alive in that. Okay, so I've been over uh, there again last week doing that. Um, other than that, it's just kind of normal, normal city business. We did have uh, one of our finalists in for public works director in this week, and we'll have our second finalist in next week, so we're working on that process <coughs> as well, and I think Carrie just got the applications out for police chief, uh, I think yesterday or today. Mm -hmm. So we're working through uh, both of those processes. Did you want someone for radio in the morning? Yeah, anyone want to do radio in the morning? I'd like to go to my other office for a couple minutes. Um, if not, I can do it. But Keith, you want to do it? Sure. It's just the coho. It's the seven. seven are they having a? Are they having the legislators tomorrow? I will verify and let okay. you know. So if they if have the legislative one, you go at about seven thirty. Yeah, seven twenty, and then it starts at seven thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Anything else, council members, from your stuff, Mark? 
two issues uh, or two two comments. One real easy. Uh, uh, when Anti Downtown Association Board met yesterday, um, the uh, association really appreciates uh, those of us that were able to attend the banquet. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, they appreciate the work that the city is uh, helping with on the lighting project. I think at our report there was just two lights left to be installed downtown, and they're very appreciative. I guess the other comment I wanted to make would, was to, uh, this was kind of tough tonight, and I want to, uh, I think we want to thank Chief Robbins for his explanation and, and Detective Sergeant West for your work on the uh, on the search, I uh, and I don't really want to talk about that as much as something that I've mentioned to some of you and to staff and have asked for a, a uh, placeholder for our later discussion in a retreat this year. And it has to do with what we have accepted as a community in terms of uh, transportation improvements, uh, specifically the uh, South End Bridge project. Yeah. If you look at what peer communities and other areas of the state have received in terms of aesthetics on these transportation projects, we really lost out. We lost a lot. If you look at the end of uh, Stevens Street that has been blocked, that's the entrance to our community. Mm -hmm. The big mastheads for the signals in that. If you take um, the, um, the second exit, if you will, uh, the ones that goes into Staples, uh, we have uh, Jersey barriers and vehicles saying welcome to Wenatchee. If you um, go um, uh, by the, I call it the Fred Meyer Bypass, you have, uh, in, in or around the, the Cloverleaf, you have straight, sterile concrete walls. Now go to no Highway 99 in Shoreline and tell me that that's what they have. <laughs> and now we have a situation, and I drive the bridge at least twice a day during the work week, and I encounter at least a couple times a month, people walking on, I call it the upstream side of the bridge, right? You know, the Jersey barrier and you have that much room or riding their bikes there. And uh, I'm, I'm sure they're horrified, I am, when I, when I encounter them. And so I think we have some, you know, and this isn't a condemnation of the, of the, of the, of the design team for the Washington State Department of Transportation at all. It's, it's really on us, what did we accept? And now we have a situation where we may not have uh, we have another safety concern that the chief pointed out, and um, I'm not going to sit on this. You know, I, I realize aesthetics and safety cost money, but but it's our community, and um, um, I, I, it's, I, I'm just I'm. Like I said, I drive it a lot, and I'm frustrated by what we've allowed our community to look like on the entrance associated with that transportation improvement project. Mm -hmm. And so there's some things we can do uh, to fix that, but there's also some things we can just do to be cognizant in the future that uh, we deserve better. Our community deserves better than what we got out of that project. Have a comment? Like yeah, Tom, go ahead. Um, on the, the bridge issue, um, I contacted uh, the traffic engineer's office with state DOT and talk to them about that area of the bridge where the opening is. And of course, like I explained earlier, when they did the construction, you know, they, they put that sidewalk out, they built a structure. They widened the bridge and then they built a structure there to put that sidewalk on. And it's approachable. You have to go around a loop on the on our side here to get on the sidewalk, you know. So, um, but between the sidewalk and the roadbed where the structure goes up, the overhead structure, that's where it's open in there because of those big girders that come down and it's open all the way across to the point of the, where it comes back down again. And the traffic engineer wasn't aware of it when I contacted him. And so they were going to go right out and check it. So I'm not sure what they're doing right now, but I notified them when they were going to get right out and take a look at it because they were surprised it was open like that after that construction. So um, just, just a point so you, you know that we did report it. And uh, I'll follow up with them too to find out what they're going to do. I call them and find out if, if they've made a plan yet, but it's going to take some, it's going to take some work to, to remedy that so that there's something there uh, for someone to step out on. But uh, and we could do some stuff on that on that Stephen Street area if we decide as a city we want to landscape it and do some stuff. You know, we've got some money and the ability to help there. The other entrance is tough because you got a code enforcement issue, and I know we're spending a lot of time down there trying to get the 
the trucks moved and stuff, and that's a bit of a tough spot. But I'd like I'd love to see us do some yeah, sort I, of landscaping I, or water feature on that as you come be, across the bridge. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and and again, you know, aesthetics cost money, and I realize that you know we have priorities that we spend our money on. Um, uh, but when we're looking at the health, the economic health of our community, and the desirability of people to bring their business here, to bring their their families here. Uh, we have to put our best foot forward. It, it's yep. just no other way to put it. Uh, you know, in that same off-ramp, I want to know what's on the right-hand side there. Is that supposed to be a sidewalk? Is it just gravel? Is it a weed patch? What is it between the fence at Locomotive Park and the curb line? It's like this nothingness and an afterthought. Um, and now, you know, with the safety thing, you know, I, I, I can't imagine, I, I just couldn't fathom what that family is, is going through. <sighs> and... Um, he said, I drive that, that stretch and every day, including today, I, I think about that incident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing, I'll just throw in this other thing. The other thing is there's so much debris on that bridge, and I realize the Jersey barriers are there not, not only to help contain traffic, but probably material from going into the river. Uh, there's enough, there's, there's the occasional, occasional rear ender on the, on the bridge. There's a lot of, in the, people that are hauling stuff to the transfer station, there's debris constantly on that road. And I look at it and I just think, man, it just doesn't, doesn't look good. Isn't that acceptable? But I, I know they also put those up there because there was a vehicle that actually made it through the rails yeah. and into the river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm as sorry. To, as just... to the safety issue though, how about, I, I've never seen signs saying you can't walk through here or no bicycles through here. Maybe some signage. There, there would really help is with the no, safety issue. Yeah, there is no, no direction there. It's it's um, intuitive. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you not, know, and our and intuition isn't always mm -hmm. what it should be. Yeah. All right, anything else for the good of the order? All right, so next week we have a work session and then the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we're adjourned. And spring ahead. Sunday. Yep.